The other uh, bank that is in the headlines at the moment is the Reserve Bank. And the reappointment for a five-year term of the current, current governor of the Reserve Bank, Adrian Orr, which seems to have many people upset um, and crying foul, etc. Is it foul? What is, if there is a problem with Adrian Orr, what is it? And how does the normal person in the street who wouldn't know the Reserve Bank if they uh, if it jumped up and bit them on the bum, how do we make sense of this and who should we believe? We are joined now by economic, uh, former Reserve Bank economist and now economic commentator, I guess, on the blog Croaking Cassandra, Michael Riddell. Michael, welcome to the program. Nice to have you with us. Yeah, morning, Sean. All right. Could I ask, Michael, that during this interview, you assume I am a complete idiot when it comes to <laughs> central banking policies, like most people in the country, so that we can have a, a conversation I can understand and the audience has some chance of understanding. Is that okay with you? You there? Yes. Okay. All right, Michael, um, firstly... Uh, what is the criticism of Adrian or as Governor of the Reserve Bank based on in layman's terms? Ultimately, that he doesn't command respect from his professional peers or across the political spectrum anymore, and that really matters if you're a Reserve Bank Governor who exercises a great deal of power over all our lives and has an appointment that straddles from one government to the next. It's a five-year term. That's an appropriate sort of length of an appointment. Um, but, you know, digging down, I wrote on my blog the other day a list of 21 reasons why I thought that Adrian shouldn't have been reappointed. Um, and, you know, they boil down to a bunch of things. The other day, for example, he was misleading Parliament. Uh, he told Parliament that uh, if only they'd been able to forecast the Russian invasion of Ukraine, inflation would have been within the target range. But it was just nonsense. The inflation rate was already miles above target a year ago, uh, well before Putin invaded Ukraine. Um, he's done that sort of thing before. He's degraded the quality of, expert, of analysis um, at the Reserve Bank. Reserve Bank used to be a hothouse of research and smart analysis, um, digging into things, looking at them carefully. Um, it's just gone by the wayside, and that was included in the report they published on their own performance. Yeah, um, and, and that, they've done a review of themselves... And I think the and headline, not, even in stuff today, says Reserve Bank's review fails credibility test. Yeah, and I think there's nothing wrong with internal reviews in and of themselves. I mean, I've led some in the past at the Reserve Bank looking at how we've handled things um, at times over the years. The question is, how deeply have you dug in? What's the evidence of the sort of self-scrutiny that you've engaged in? And there was nothing of that in the report yesterday. They showed no sign of doing anything other than trying to defend their stance, not looking at alternative arguments or approaches um, that people have come up with. And you can see one of the international reviewers they got to help them in the process. He's polite in his remarks, but it's quite clear you go through it point by point. And he's really quite critical of the analytical weaknesses um, yeah. in the report. And then you go on to Adrian, you know, he appointed a deputy chief executive responsible for monetary policy who has no background in economics or monetary policy at all. No other serious central bank in the world uh, would have made such an appointment. He's lost senior manager after senior manager after senior manager. The staff turnover is incredibly high. He's a polarising figure. He doesn't engage with um, different views. He doesn't welcome challenge or debate. So you can just go on and on down the list. This is not someone who's suitable uh, to hold the role. OK, Michael, by your analysis... Oh, look, I have to ask this because we're going to get accusations of it. Under what circumstances did you leave the Reserve Bank and were they good? Well, um, I was made redundant about seven or eight years ago. Okay. Um, but it was highly welcome to me. I, my uh, kids were growing up and I wanted to spend time as a, a parent. So, you know, I moved to the city retirement very, very yep. happily. Okay, Michael, I just wanted to clear that up. Yeah. How different would life for the average New Zealander be if we had, in your opinion, a Reserve Bank governor who was more competent, who was better liked, who didn't lie, as you have accused him of, to Parliament? Misleading Parliament, I think. But um, I, I think the... I mean, it's a good question, Sean. I, I think the difficulty one has in that is that many of the mistakes that were made last year around monetary policy 
was made by many central banks um, around the world with their governors. And that's why you'll notice when I went through that list, I didn't emphasize the inflation number as the reason why he shouldn't have been reappointed. They made a mistake. They were responsible. Um, but it was a mistake that was pretty widely shared by private forecasters um, and by central banks in other okay. countries. It, it's unfortunate that you don't fire someone for that. So a, a, a better ideal central bank, we wouldn't have interest rates being ramped up rapidly at the moment, facing recession next year. But I'm not sure you can solely um, say that a different governor would have made much better decisions in the circumstances. OK, well, that, well that, that's an omission there, Michael. So you're saying he hasn't done anything that he deserves to be fired for? Well, fired and reappointed are two different things. Uh, what I'm saying is I don't think he's fit for the job, that list of reasons that I ran through. Well, if he's They're not fit for the job, of, he shouldn't be there. Well, he shouldn't be there, but all, all I'm saying is the, the, the reason he shouldn't be there is that long list of things I ran through before you yeah, previously, yeah. not specifically the inflation numbers. Because, you know, you could sack every central banker around the world at the moment. And, you, you know, you could make a case that shoot a few to encourage the others discipline and encourage yeah. them to focus on inflation in the future. But when you're a central banker, you're grappling with a huge amount of uncertainty about how the economy is operating. And you just can't hold people yeah. to unreasonable standards. Well, some might say better the devil we know than the devil we don't just because Dad burns the dinner doesn't mean you get the dog to cook. <laughs> and it's a fair line, but, you know, so then you've got to look at uh, is this just one or two things that he's done or not? Is it just one or two critics? And it's not. You know, you look across the professional audiences, Adrian does not command respect. The major opposition parties don't have any confidence in him. That's not a desirable position. It's not that he's a partisan figure. It's that he does not command respect. It was a reasonable punt to appoint him five years ago. He shouldn't have been reappointed now. Grant Robertson shouldn't have gone ahead uh, knowing that there was that degree of... Uh, well, he had decision. to do it now because you get closer to an election than certain prohibitions on making decisions that bind oh, future oh. governments. Well, 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 that's true. Adrian's term expires in March, so the decision had been made. But the point is he should have taken Adrian aside several months ago and looks, said, look, Adrian, it hasn't worked. There isn't that widespread confidence. Y you know, you go and find something else to do. Put out an announcement saying you're pursuing fresh opportunities and we'll look around for a replacement. OK. Date. What are the options for an incoming, if there were to be a change of government late next year after an election? Uh, can uh, a new government remove a, a Reserve Bank Governor? Uh, not generally, and that's as, as it should be. You know, you don't want um, people being able to be sacked. So he's easily. there. He's there uh, for five years. I, I, I think not easily. Um, <laughs> I mean, you can only you, you can dismiss him for cause, but it would have to be for things that he'd done after his second yeah. term started. In March. And even you're not suggesting um, he's done anything criminal or anything oh, else. Absolutely not. Yeah, Michael Parvin no, it seems just, to be that you just people just don't like him. I think there's some of that. I mean, it's not the case for me. I, I, I don't have much to do, anything to do with him these days. Uh, he's a fun guy to be around at times. He yeah. can't sort of, you know, a bunch of loyalists. This is just the question of a dispassionate uh, working through the list of pros and cons, how well he's done, the personal qualities he's displayed for such an important and powerful position. But you're right, he does alienate some people. Some of that he does deliberately. He has a, a style that is deliberately polarising in nature. Um, and you can talk to commentators around town yeah. who've had uh, yeah, you know, very dismissive run-ins with him um, yeah. over his time as governor. Yeah, I, I hate to say it, I think I emceed at his 40th or 50th birthday party. That's just an admission. Oh. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I haven't seen him for a while, um, but I do know him. So, Michael, we're stuck with Adrian Orr. For the next five years, then, is what you're saying? I, I, think it's, I think it's not quite that. They can't dismiss them. What they can do is reorient the institution. So, for example, they put in place a monetary policy committee a couple of years ago. Adrian dominates that. It would be relatively easy for the minister to change that, to appoint stronger independent members of the committee, give them the right to express their views more openly and publicly. The bank has been given a big increase in its budget, which Adrian's used to um, bloat staff numbers. A new government could wind that back. Um, they can use things, bureaucratic tools like statements of intent and letters of expectation to change the environment. And at some point, Adrian himself may conclude that this is just not what he wants to carry on doing. It's, it's not a comfortable environment for him personally. Yeah. All right. Uh, I, I, I hear you. Um, I also, because we've got you here and I've Talk to Roger Bowman from the Bankers Association this morning who says this open banking thing, and if you're not, you know, you're not across this, or this in your area, it's best 
expertise, feel free to tell me to rack off, but he basically gave us the message that open banking, if you think that's some sort of blow against bank profits, it's not. It was a largely procedural change that was coming anyway, which has just been dressed up because the government wants to look tough on rich people. Would you agree with that, Michael? Oh, I think that's probably right. I mean, open banking is a sensible move in its own right, but it's not really going to change the overall profitability of the banking sector very much at all, I wouldn't have thought. All right. Um, and, and look, but just back uh, to Mr Orr, what isn't he doing that he should in the current economic environment? Whether or not you like him or not, don't like yeah. his smile or not, what is it, what's the one thing the Reserve Bank Governor should be doing now that he isn't, that might improve our economy and our lives? I think the biggest thing probably is that openness to debate and analysis. Um, you know, digging more deeply, asking more searching questions and being clearly open to um, receiving and, and uh, engaging with alternative perspectives. They, they've raised interest rates a lot. They're probably within 50 or 70 points of having done enough. Uh, they, that was belated, but they've done it now. Uh, and now we just have to live with the pain that getting inflation down is going to involve. All right. Uh, so you are talking more about style and substance in terms of need for change. Uh, in terms of the management approach and the leadership of the institution rather than the specific OCR decisions now. Yeah. Michael, I thank you very much indeed for your time and for keeping it in terms that I could understand and, <laughs> and our listeners. Thank you very much indeed. Good to talk to you, Sean. Cheers. Okay. Michael Reddle, um, uh, he writes, uh, a blog called Croaking Cassandra. It's not a bad read if you do it slowly for people like me. Because I'll be honest, bankers and economists and people who do numbers, they can lose me pretty quickly, and I like to keep it simple. Um, maybe the problem with Adrian Orr is that people just don't like him. I've met the bloke. He's all right. He's a good fellow to have a beer with. I don't know if he's still drinking. Apparently, he's found his ethnic side of things, which is, which is, which is good. So, I don't know. I don't know. I think often these, um, you know, you read about these stories about the Reserve Bank and the business pages. I think it's a little removed from what most people get into. Um, Sean, it seems to be, oh, this is good. Now, this is good from Ian. Ian, this is, Ian is bringing an issue like this down to the everyman's level. Simple text. It says, Sean, it seems to me that Adrian Orr is like Ian Foster. And he is. He is to the financial sort of um, sphere of New Zealand, what Ian Foster is to sport, right? He's the coach. He's got the job. He's not going anywhere. But we are not too happy with the results. That is good. Has anyone ever seen Ian Foster and Adrian Orr in the same room? That's another question we can ask. That is an excellent text, Ian.